the, the faculty member is Bob Curry. Uh, actually, it was Pele Kramer, but were you also the mentor? I'm the second reader and co-mentor. So yeah. co-mentor yeah. will introduce our next Palvi scholars. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm Bob Curry from biology. Um, Pele Kramer uh, can't be here because of a, a sick child, so she's on her way for the honors presentation later today that Kate will do. Uh, so Pelleg's in geography and, and environment, I'm in biology, and we've co-mentored Kate this year on her project. Um, so I got to know Kate uh, a while back. She took my ecology class sophomore year, did very well in the class. Uh, she is a geography, well, environmental science and biology, environmental science major, biology minor, which in my mind is a really good combination because you really need, uh, I've always been interested in both. Uh, I've always loved maps. Uh, as a big part of what I do as an ecologist. We study animals and their territorial patterns and uh, distribution across habitats and uh, those kinds of patterns. That's been part of what I've done through my whole career. I uh, used to do some GIS, Geographic Information System work. I'm way behind Kate on that. <laughs> so now she knows what she's doing, I don't. Um, so uh, it's been fun working with her because she has helped uh, get me back into some of that type of, of work, as you'll hear about. Um, so she, uh, Kate later took uh, uh, the, um, my conservation biology class, which is a good application of some of this work. And then most recently, she was part of our group that went to Costa Rica for two weeks for our field ecology class. And she did a nice <coughs> project down there, and uh, we're, that's all wrapped up now. So now it's just down to the thesis. Uh, and that is, a, as you'll hear, is a combination of Kate's mapping expertise uh, uh, matched up with one of my graduate students who works on birds in the Dominican Republic. These are birds that I still have not seen yet. I've seen one of them, the Puerto Rican one you'll hear about. Uh, but I haven't been to the Dominican Republic yet. Um, so this is all new to me. And uh, Kate's found some really neat patterns and we're having fun trying to understand those. Happy to introduce Kate and uh, enjoy the So hi everyone, thank you very much for that introduction. As Dr. Curry mentioned, this is my senior thesis work. I've been doing niche modeling for toady birds and the greater Antilles. So as Dr. Curry mentioned, I do have a background in both environmental science and biology. And going into my thesis, I had known that I was really interested in finding a project that was going to draw on both of these elements. So I started to talk to Dr. Curry about this project at the end of the year last year. One of his graduate students, Holly Garrett, has been studying toadies in the Dominican Republic for several years from a biological and behavioral perspective. So I was really interested in kind of being able to approach the same research issue from an environmental and geographic perspective to supplement her work. Toadies are a cool study subject, and also I was also drawn to the topic because there is a knowledge gap about them. There aren't a lot of studies about them. There isn't a lot of detailed information about their ranges or their habitat uses. So I want to try to fill in this knowledge gap a little bit which meant that I did spend very many hours in the Falvey Library going through a lot of journals, a lot of databases, trying to get my own information on toadies up to par and see what we already know about them. And I was also really interested in the topic because I had never done anything with niche modeling before. My mentors had not done a ton of niche modeling work, and I was really excited about the idea of being able to try something new. So to start off with, just by establishing what niche modeling is, it is a really powerful predictive tool that lets us make assumptions and determine what environments a species might be found in and what habitats are suitable for them based on the biotic and abiotic environmental conditions of the places that we know that they're present. You treat your study area as a grid of pixels where each pixel is filled with a bunch of different environmental variables and then you're able to make assumptions based on the pixels where you know the species is present. Niche models can be really powerful predictors, especially when you have a species like toadies where there isn't a lot known about them you don't have extensive data, a niche model is a really good first way of filling in these knowledge gaps. So toadies are the birds that I've been working with. There are five species, they're all native to the Caribbean. They live in a variety of habitats ranging from dry scrub all the way up through wet montane forests. They live mostly in vegetated areas because they're feeding on insects. They prefer habitats that have lots of leaves, lots of branches, to be, lots of vegetation to be feeding around. And there is a knowledge gap about, among other things, their ranges and their exact population sizes. 
So this map just shows where toadies are found, the species that I've been looking at. Three islands have one species apiece. There's the Cuban toady, the Jamaican toady, and the Puerto Rican toady. And then Hispaniola, the island with Haiti and the Dominican Republic, is a really cool case because you actually have two species there. There are broad-billed toadies and narrow-billed toadies. So Hispaniola, ecologically, is very interesting because you have niche partitioning. So for those of you who haven't heard the term before, a species ecological niche is essentially the role that it plays in an ecosystem, where it lives, what it eats, how it behaves, and you can't have two species with the exact same niche in the same ecosystem because one of them will end up out competing the other and pushing it away. So when we have a case like on Hispaniola, where there are two closely related species, we have niche partitioning, where the species change something about their behavior or something about where they're living so they can coexist. For the broad-billed toadies and narrow-billed toadies, elevation is the main element of this niche partitioning, that broad-billed toadies tend to be found at lower elevations and drier forests, and narrow-billed toadies live at higher elevations and wetter forests. However, we know that there are a couple zones of overlap. That's where Holly does a lot of her master's thesis work, including mid middle elevations in the Cordillera Central Mountains, the Sierra de Baruco, and the Samana Peninsula. So we have a couple interesting research questions we can ask about toadies. We can look at the ecology and habitat use of the two species on an island together and how they are similar or different. And we can also compare these two sympatric species on an island together to the three species that are on an island by themselves. So for my thesis, I use this modeling software called Maxun. It stands for Maximum Entropy Modeling, and it pretty much starts by assuming that species are just uniformly distributed across the landscape and then constrains this based on the environmental variables and where we've seen a species. It was developed in 2004 by Phillips et al, and it's really useful for a couple of reasons. The first is that it can use presence-only data, which means that we don't need to have had extensive surveys saying, okay, there are definitely no toadies at all in this area of woods. The way that it uses its machine learning algorithms and equations, it works with just presence data. It's general purpose, it's flexible, and it can work even with small sample sizes. So there are two major inputs that I'm putting into these models. The first one are just the presence locations of where toadies have been seen. So for this, I use data from a website called eBird. eBird is a citizen science site run by Cornell University. And it's really cool that birders all over the world can input what species they've seen and where they've seen them. So I used, actually got this data from Holly, the master's student that she'd worked with before. She had previously used this data set and cleaned it up to get rid of observations that were likely inaccurate, observations that were missing information, observations where the person observing the birds was moving a long distance and it probably wasn't spatially accurate. And then I split this down by species, and I actually end up filtering this further to get rid of any observations that were within 500 meters of each other. This helps to reduce spatial autocorrelation in the models, and also helps to try to get rid of some of the bias towards just popular birding locations. The second main input for my models were the environmental variables that I used elevation data, land cover, and then the 19 bioclimatic variables from a site called WorldClim. These are things like temperature and precipitation, but also include more specific variables, such as how temperature varies throughout the year, what the precipitation is like during the warmest month of the year, etc. So I used Esri ArcGIS to process this data. As I mentioned earlier, I had to filter down where the birds were seen to get rid of some of the bias in the data. And I also, for Maxent to work, the environmental variables are presented as pixels. The pixels all have to be the exact same size and they have to be lined up perfectly. So I did this in ArcGIS and then clipped everything down to the country. So in terms of the models, the results, these are what the maps end up looking like. The blue areas are the lowest suitability and the red areas are the highest suitability. So you sort of get this scale of based on these environmental variables, how suitable is the habitat for toadies? How likely are you to see toadies at these different sites? The other number you'll keep seeing at the bottom of the maps is the AUC. This stands for area under the receiver operating curve, and it is basically just a way of showing how well the model fits the data. It looks at when you have presences when you should have presences and absences when you should have absences. That for a model with presence and absence data, a perfect score would be one. However, it's calculated a little bit differently when you don't have absence data. So the best score you can get is about 0 0.9, 0 0.9 96 to 0 0.97. So I was aiming to get all of my models as close to 0 0.9 as I could. So most of these are a good fit. We can see on Cuba that land cover was the most important factor in determining the fit of the model, that toadies favored areas with broadleaf evergreen and broadleaf deciduous forest. Precipitation was also important with toadies. There are a few clusters of toadies in dry areas, but for the most part, the birds favored the wetter parts of the island. 
For the most part, the zones of highest suitability are along the coasts and up in the Sierra de las Organas Mountains. There are two main reasons for this. The first is that the coastal areas have a lot of national parks and protected forests, whereas the middle of the country is mostly farmland, which is not quite as suitable of a habitat for toadies. The other reason here with the eBird data, we likely do have a little bit of bias towards the coast, especially in a country such as Cuba, because eBird is primarily being used by tourists who are likely staying a little bit closer to the resorts and not going all the way to the farms in the middle of the country. Next up, we have Puerto Rico. Here, precipitation is a really important factor for determining where the toadies are found, determining the fit of the model, that with the exception of the El Yunque National Park, where there are a lot of toadies and it's very wet, for the most part, toadies were found in the drier to moderate parts of the island during the driest quarter. Temperature was also important, with toadies being found in cooler areas during the warmest month and found in areas that had more seasonal variation in temperature. The hot spots here are El Yunque National Park in the northeast, the Cordillera Central Mountains in the middle of the country, and the Guanica Scrub and Dry Forest in the southwest. In Jamaica, to most of the areas of highest suitability were these blue mountains in the eastern part of the country. Precipitation in the coldest quarter was very important for determining the model's fit, rep being responsible for 37% of the fit, which is one of the highest values that I saw in the study. The toadies are mostly found in these wetter areas in the blue mountains, where the land cover is mostly broadleaf evergreen forests or these mixed forests. And then we get into the two species on Hispaniola, and we see some really cool results there. But this first map is for the broad-billed toadies, which are the ones that tend to be found at lower elevations. And you can see that they're really widely distributed across the lower parts of the island. The elevation was indeed the most important variable for determining model fit, that they, these toadies very much preferred lowlands. Next up was land cover, where they were mostly found in broadleaf evergreen forest, which I'd expected. And interestingly enough, there were a lot of toadies found in grassland, which I really did not expect. I thought that they would be it completely in forested or scrub areas that had some more vegetative cover. In terms of precipitation during the warmest quarter, they tended to be found in drier areas in the narrow-billed toadies. So we can remember this map and then go on to the next one, which is these narrow-billed toadies. And you can see that their distribution is much more is much smaller. They are confined to these high elevation areas in the mountain ranges. Elevation it was a super important variable for determining the model's fit for them. It was responsible for 37% of the model fit. They were mostly in broadleaf evergreen forest, and they were found in areas that were wetter during the wettest month than those where broad-billed toadies were found. You can see here is that Cordillera Central Mountains in the middle of the country were a big hot spot for them, the Sierra de Baruco in the south, and over in the Massif de la Hot here in the western part in Haiti. This map just compares the ranges for the two species on Hispaniola, that for the sake of this map I'd considered a greater than 50% suitability to mean that the bird was present. So we have broad-billed toadies in blue, narrow-billed toadies in red, and then these purple zones are the zones where there's o at middle elevations where there is overlap between the two species. You have a little bit in the Cordillera Central in the middle of the country, and again the Sierra de Baruco and the Massif de la Hot, we see some of these purple areas. So to sort of sum up the major findings, for the two species on Hispaniola, elevation was the most important variable for determining where they lived. This was this major element of the niche partitioning. And for the other three species, elevation was really a non-factor. It was extremely low in terms of its contribution to the model fit. The birds were just found throughout the various elevations. Land cover was important for all of the species. It was a top three variable for almost everyone. And for the Puerto Rican toad, it was actually the fourth variable. And then for the everyone, but particularly the three species on the island by themselves, precipitation was extremely important. That this was probably because of the role that precipitation has on vegetative structure, but kind of to sum it up, for the two species on the island together that have evolved with this competition, it's elevation and land cover that determines where they live. For the three species on the islands by themselves, it's land cover and precipitation is the most important variables. So these models are conservative estimates just due to the nature of the eBird data set that some areas are likely slightly underrepresented just because of a lack of observations. But overall, these models do give us better ideas of toady distribution than they have now. They help contribute to our knowledge of exactly where toady, of the important environmental factors for toady ecology, and they offer a really good starting point for future investigations. Additionally, this study shows that niche models can be a viable way of taking citizen science data and letting us make assumptions about species that we have knowledge gaps about. So with that, I'd like to thank Dr. Curry and Dr. Kremer for being wonderful mentors throughout this project. I'd like to thank Holly for all of her help, all of the questions she's, uh, my questions that she's answered about toadies, and I'd really like to thank the Falvey Library for this award. So with that, are there any questions?
Thank you, Kate. Uh, I'd like to present you with the 2018 uh, Falvey Scholar Award on behalf of Falvey Library and the Center for Research and Fellowships. Please join me in congratulating Kate on her accomplishments. And now we're moving on to our third Falvey Scholar of the day, and our faculty me mentor is Dr. Michael Tomko, who will introduce uh, our next scholar. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Simron. Um, I want to just say a quick word about Simron's project, which is on death and dying, um, and how it how it originated, uh, because Simran, uh, during this process, has worried that uh, everyone's going to think she's really morbid and depressing because <laughs> she's a college student writing on death and dying. Um, so this grew out of our uh, what's called our human person uh, gateway seminar. I teach in the humanities department. Simran's a biology and humanities double major. And humanities is an interdisciplinary degree. It's got philosophy, theology, literature. And when I ask people, or when I tell people about it, they say, well, what is that, about the meaning of life? And I'm like, well, yeah, that's <laughs> it's about the meaning of life. And so the human person course is a course that follows human life from birth to death. And we actually start with death. Uh, and we start with death and the realization that we are mortal beings there's a finite amount of time on Earth, and we need to think about how that affects the way we're going to live. So we started with that, and since she was a sophomore, Cimarron has been thinking about that. Death, not simply as a kind of morbid topic, but death as a topic that can help us think more about how we should live, who we are, how we relate to one another, and our place in the cosmos. Um, so that's where it started, and I must say, uh, I've talked about this topic in my class uh, over a number of years, and Simran has taken it and run with it, and that typifies her as a student. She's one of the most um, mindful and thoughtful students I've taught over the years, which is saying a lot, uh, but she also has a capacity not only to see the importance of the topic in and of itself, but to think about its implications. Uh, so she has taken our, our uh, consideration of death and dying and, and really run with it and thought about not only how it affects us as people, uh, people who live in community and are dependent upon those that we live in community with, uh, but she also immediately saw that as a future doctor, and she's going off to medical school next year, uh, this is going to be a huge part of what she does. Um, so to better prepare herself for it, uh, interacting with patients, interacting with families to better understand um, what the dying process means to those who uh, are undergoing it, who have a, have a terminal diagnosis, but also the community of people around her. Uh, so she's given a lot of thought about how to be a good person uh, and how to be a good doctor, and she's written a very good thesis uh, as a result. So I'm going to let her uh, tell you about that, and uh, thank you, Simran, for uh, the opportunity to work with uh, you on this. Uh, Dr. De Benedetto from the biology department, uh, and I'm glad I can say her name but not spell it. Uh, <laughs> she was another important mentor on this project, and we're both very uh, grateful to have been able to bring part of it. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, first, thank you, Dr. Tomko, for introducing me. Um, so today I'll be talking to you about uh, my honors thesis, um, and it's titled Death and Dying, the Literature, Philosophy, and Practices of Adult and Pediatric End-of-Life Care. So Dr. Tomko touched on it a little bit, but I'll go into a little more detail. So why death? Um, apart from my personal experiences with death, um, I've had a couple of family members and friends um, go through the experience. Uh, one of the most important factors that played a role in choosing this topic was one, Dr. Tomko's human person class, and two, the fact that at Villanova we're always asked, how do you live a good life? We're asked this on the first day um, in ACS, and this is weaved through our gateway courses um, until the end, until senior year, where we're asked, is there any changes um, with how we believe we can lead a good life? 
But throughout this, until I took Dr. Thompson's class, I didn't really uh, think about death. And I feel that we, we don't really think about death on, on a day-to-day -day basis. We live in a very death-avoidant culture. We don't think about it unless it applies to us. We don't think about it unless someone in our lives have, has been personally affected by it. So I want to bring that more into our language, into our conversations on a daily life. So um, in my thesis, I argue that it is possible to um, die a good death, but this isn't a sole endeavor. This requires um, a multifactorial approach, a holistic approach, and so that's what I'll be going into in my thesis. So the outline of my thesis, it's a three-part thesis. Um, for the introduction, I basically talk about how the meaning of death has changed over time. So in the beginning, during the Stone Age, we find that there's not much um, anticipation for death. It's very sudden. It just happens. So because of that, there's not a lot of contemplation that occurs with death. With death. So after that, um, we see that death is viewed as if you have a good life, you will have a good death. So that completely changes. Now, um, with the rise of technology, we see that death might have been a failure on our part, on the health healthcare professionals' part. Um, but we also see a rise in palliative care movements and um, hospice care movements. And because of that, we see that death is now something that's more holistic, that takes more contemplation. So we see that death first was more spiritual, was more moral, and that kind of changes to something that's more technological, more physical, and more psychological. So in the first part of my thesis, I talk about a good death. I do this by doing a um, fictional case study. So I take two characters from um, novels, so one from Wendell Berry's Hannah Coulter. So I analyze Nathan Coulter, and the other, which I'm sure you all have heard about, um, The Death of Ivan Ilyich by Leo Tolstoy. So I compare and contrast both of these characters to see how do their lives play a role in them dying a good death. And I argue that both of them have led very different lives. They have had very different priorities, but, and they also have had very different dying processes, but their death itself, I argue that they have had good death. So looking at both of these characters and um, bringing in my biology background, so analyzing um, scientific articles and journal articles, I come together and I bring up uh, many different factors in dying a good death. So um, I'll go on to that a little bit later. Part two is pediatric end-of-life care. So I basically take part one, um, what the factors that apply in part one, and I see are there any additional complicating factors where a child can die a good death, and is that even possible? And part three, because um, as Dr. Tonko mentioned, I will be going to medical school um, next semester. I wanted to see the role that I would play in the future, hopefully, and also the role that healthcare professionals play now in um, aiding in the dying process. So I'm just gonna, for each part, I'm gonna bring a little bit of a representative quote, tell you about it, and continue from there. So for part one, um, again, which is um, on dying a good death and the factors it takes to die a good death, this is an excerpt from Leo Tolstoy's uh, The Death of Ivan Ilyich. And suddenly it flashed through the screen and he saw it. It had only appeared as a flash, so he hoped it would disappear, but involuntarily he became aware of his side. The pain was still there, gnawing at him, and he could no longer forget. It was staring at him distinctly from behind the plants. What was the point of it all? He went to his study, lay down, and once again he was left alone with it, face to face with it, unable to do anything with it, simply look at it and grow numb with horror. So you can see that Ivan Ilyich, he's led a very lonely life. It, it hasn't been the greatest. Um, he's had a very hard dying process without people there for him to support him. Um, so what I do basically is take Ivan Ilyich and I compare him to Nathan Coulter, um, as I said earlier. I then uh, come up with a comprehensive list of factors it takes uh, to die a good death. I argue that you don't need all of these factors, but it depends on the person's experience, it depends on their life, um, it depends on many other things. So uh, pain and symptom management first before getting into the psychological, into the spiritual, we have to make sure that the pain itself is under control, the diagnosis is being managed, etc. Then um, I go into the stages of grief. So this is um, famous, I'm sure you all have heard about it, um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross came up with five different um, stages of ex eventually accepting your death. 
Um, so then that brings me to my next point, the awareness and acceptance of death. Um, and this acceptance, it's not one of regret, it's not one of despair, it's more of one rooted in faith, more of one rooted in hope. Um, then patient dignity and autonomy, how much of a role does the person have in their own death? Is the doctor making the decision for them or are they able to take some agency over their death? Um, the next point is emotional support and family presence and again, this is as much as the person wants it. If the person doesn't want it, then they don't have to have it. The, the whole point of this is that death is tailored towards what the person wants. So, um, but it's found that having a lot of emotional support, having family, having loved ones involved in all of this can aid in um, facilitating a good death. Um, then clear communication by healthcare professionals. So not only are healthcare professionals supposed to communicate well with um, the patient and with the patient's loved ones, but they're also <coughs> Uh, they should also communicate well with each other. So we found that when we look at uh, specialties and a lot of the times when dealing with terminally ill patients, there's more than one doctor or type of doctor involved. And a lot of the times the communication between them isn't that great. So making sure that they're, they agree on a uh, treatment plan, making sure that they're in this together and communicating about the patient that there's no gaps in treatment. Um, then satisfaction with life, and that also goes hand in hand with spirituality. So um, the case study between Nathan Coulter and Ivan Ilyich basically um, analyzes how you can live a good life and how that translates into dying a good death. So how does the satisfaction of life, how does how you live your life um, translate to uh, how you die? And spirituality and religion also, if you choose to be spiritual and religious, how does that play a role in dying a good death? Does knowing about the afterlife play a role in how you perceive your death. And lastly, this is more logistical, but where do you want to die? What is your last wish? Do you, ha uh, do you need anything um, to bring closure into your death? Um, part two is a quote um, for the pediatric section, so for the pediatric end of life, and this is from Flannery O'Connor's Death of a Child, and um, this is centered around Marianne, who's a nine-year-old, um, she passed away with a, because she had a facial tumor. Um, so Mary Ann would climb up on the patient's bed and they would have long and serious conversations. In the next bed, there was a patient who was noted for complaining about everything. One morning, the woman said her coffee was cold. Sister Josephine paid no attention, feeling that the coffee had just come from the kitchen and it would certainly be hot. However, Mary Ann turned around, took a spoon off her tray, jumped off the bed, and proceeded to put a spoon in the woman's cup of coffee. Everyone watched with interest as she tasted it. She put the spoon down and muttered, stone cold, and went back to her place on the bed. I love this quote. Um, you can see her maturity and her wisdom. She was just nine years old, and you can see that um, her innocence plays such a big role in um, giving other people a chance, and that's something that even the adults can't do in this case. So I argue that the factors that we see in part one carry over to the pediatric section but there are additional complicating factors. And I want, I basically want to take all of this and see it in a lens of age and maturity. So I want to fr put it in the framework that the age of the person and the maturity level of, of the child play a big role in how their death is perceived. When a child is younger, for example, they may not even know what death entails. They may just say like, oh, okay, that person died. Like, what does that really mean? But as they grow older um, and get more mature, that changes. So if we look at it in that framework, then it's more helpful. So I argue that legacy and potential and the role of parents and loved ones are um, two additional complicating factors for pediatric end-of-life care. So for legacy and potential, a lot of people say, you know, I don't want to have to outlive my child. The child didn't have much time on earth. This is very tragic. And of course it is. But if you look at... Um, and in the framework of what they did do in their life, albeit it was, it was short, um, and how their death can affect future children with the same diagnosis. Um, how does that translate to life after that death, even if it's not physically the person being on earth? Um, and the role of parents and loved ones, because children are so young, um, parents and loved ones play a larger role in all of this. So that's, uh, those are two important considerations. And for part three, I explore the um, role of healthcare professionals in all of this. Um, and what I did was I conducted um, interviews with six different healthcare professionals around America. 
And um, I also brought in When Breath Becomes Air by Dr. Paul Kalanithi. He, he was a um, late neurosurgeon. Uh, he died about two years ago. And it's interesting to bring him in because he was a doctor, but he was also a patient. So I'm just going to read you these quotes and go into what I got from talking to these uh, healthcare professionals. So Dr. Kalanithi says, it's important to be accurate, but you must always leave some room for hope. Um, so treating the person as more than their diagnosis. Uh, the last thing you want is for a child to die an emotional life away from their parent and for their parent to be isolated and to have regret after. So the role, again, of parents and loved ones in their child's death. And to know that parents come with a lot of grief also. So not only does the child go through pain, the parent does too. And, and this extends after the child's death. And um, it's those families that we didn't reach and weren't able to help that haunt me. You know the story, you remember the things you have done wrong a million times more powerfully than the things you may have done right. For the most part, knowing that I made a difference can really help people get to the place where they can be, as sad as it is, as unfortunate as it is, as unfair as it is. So um, Dr. Wiener sheds a lot of light on uh, the dying process and she shows us the importance of self-care, the importance of having the right mindset when you're dealing with death and dying. So. Um, Basically what I do is after talking to everyone, I, I code, but not like C++ coding. I just look at um, what they say and I take out important themes and then I uh, talk about those themes. So these are um, dealing with the family's wishes in a unique and individual process and also being considerate. So for example, if we have two people with the same religion, they may not necessarily want the same things in their dying process. We can't assume that because they are of the same religion or same culture that they would want the same thing. So each individual's death is something that's unique. Um, the importance of communicating well, working together and working as a team. Um, I touched upon that before with um, the role of healthcare professionals and how they should be able to bridge gaps with each other. Um, the preservation of a child's relationship with themselves and their loved ones. Uh, creative ways to know the patient's preferences. This was very interesting. Actually, Dr. Wiener, who was quoted on the previous page, has come up with many different ways, such as um, a board game or coming up with a living will. So it's like a coloring book, but it's ways to have the child um, talk about their dying preferences in a more suitable manner for their age. Um, the larger impact and possibility of life after death, so the uh, spiritual aspect of all of this. Um, how healthcare professionals cope with um, death after the patient dies. So self-care, a lot of people um, turn to mindfulness, turn to uh, debriefing with the people involved in the death, and um, the role of technology in end-of-life care. So because technology plays such a big role in our lives, how does that translate to dying um, a good death? Is more technology involved? Like, do, if you have a lot of technology and a lot of machines for a person who's dying a good death, is that a good death, or is it one that's um, free of pain? So. Um, I wanted to thank my mentor, Dr. Tomko, uh, my reader, Dr. Di Benedetto. I really would be nothing. Um, I wouldn't have any of this under my belt without you guys and um, everyone in the honors department. So with that, um, thank you all for being here. And do you have any questions? Yes. So how did you find, how did you connect with these individuals? Okay, so initially, I didn't think that would be a big part of my thesis. So I did work at Nemours Zupont Hospital for Children over the summer. Um, and I did work on siblings of children with cancer. So I basically talked to my mentor and I said, can I interview you um, for a part of my thesis? My goal was just to have one person talk about their experience with death. And she actually said, here are people that I know, people that I've worked with, with on papers. Um, and there was one in Canada, there's one at the um, NIH, there's, they're like all over America. And um, so basically that's how, that's how it set foot and they were very helpful, so yeah. Thank you, Kisimra. Thank you. Uh, on, on behalf of Howdy Memorial Library and the Center of Research and Fellowships, I would like to present you with the 2018 Faldi Scholar Award. Please join me in congratulating Simran on her achievements. And uh, now we are moving on to our fourth scholar of the day. 
Uh, the faculty member is Dr. Elizabeth Dowdor, uh, who will introduce her. So it is with great pleasure to introduce Agnes Cho, who is not only an extraordinary human being, but a wonderful student. She is amazing, she is giving, she is intelligent, she is in the moment, she is a pleasure to have in class, she is a role model for other students. In her sophomore year, the spring of 2015, I had the good pleasure Agnes came into my office and said, I want to do research. Mm -hmm. And from that wonderful conversation, she became the only upperclassman in a research team, student-driven, looking at toddlers and guns in research. And TGIR, we would meet on Fridays, and so, you know, TGIR. <laughs> and um, so from that, she, we did the lit review, they took that poster, it was been presented here at Villanova, of course, at Johns Hopkins at their public health conference in Nashville at a National uh, Student Nurse Association conference. And she built on that. And from that, you'll hear her presentation today looking at nurse practitioners and their understandings regarding unintentional gun violence with toddlers. But she also gave of herself. We have from that group another verb we have a data scholar, her role modeling, her generosity. She is a first generation Villanovan. She is a first generation American. She is a star. <laughs> Agnes. Thank you, Dr. Dowdell, for that introduction. Um, and with that, I will get started. So I had the uh, absolute privilege of working with Dr. Dowdell um, on my project called Unintentional Gun Violence by Toddlers and uh, Advanced Pediatric Advanced uh, Practice Nurses Preventative Measures. So this research was done, as Dr. Dowdell had mentioned, um, through the VRF Fellowship and uh, this was a summer fellowship that um, generously supported my work. So before we get started, you may have a few questions. Why guns, why toddlers, and why nursing? Those are absolutely great questions. So why guns? Um, I'm sure everyone, unfortunately, has heard of tragic cases where a child gets a hold of a gun or a, of cases involving <coughs> children with gun violence. However, uh, I realized that there was not enough in the literature about gun violence involving toddlers and particularly through a home safety lens. So um, I also found that toddlers are a very understudied group and usually the literature involving gun violence is about children or about different contexts that didn't necessarily um, give nurses the realm of of prevention and highlight the preventative role that they could play. So why nursing? I briefly touched upon this, but nurses are in a very unique position to neutralize the political implications involved with gun violence and guns in general. So I decided that nurses should think about guns and can think about gun violence through a particularly health-oriented lens, and in this way we could truly make a difference. The aim of my study was to identify knowledge levels and preventative strategies of pediatric advanced practice nurses. I will refer to uh, these individuals as APRNs from now on, um, regarding home safety specific to gun violence, to gun safety. In order to answer these questions, I designed a descriptive and correlational study. And in this, I created an instrument or a survey to really assess what is going on currently and what the state of the science is. I sent this survey out to uh, the National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners, shortened as NAPNAP, and these individuals uh, who participated in the study were from Pennsylvania and Massachusetts. From these results, we had a total of 54 respondents, and I will show you what the demographic information of that population was. 
age-wise, we can see that uh, most of these individuals were in their 30s, that they were primarily white or Caucasian, and that these individuals had worked for at least 10 years in pediatric nursing. From, these, uh, from this information, we can gather that these are a knowledgeable and experienced uh, uh, group. So this was a very, very pertinent uh, sample for me to use in my study. We also found that most of these individuals had a master's in, in uh, nursing education, as well as a work position of family nurse practitioners or pediatric nurse practitioners. This also indicates that in addition to being experienced, they had expertise in the area of pediatric nursing. Because of the nature of my study, I was also curious about how many of these individuals, what percentage of them were parents. So as you can see, I found that most of them were parents. And I also asked about who of these individuals are gun owners. Found that most of them were not gun owners. So to begin my analysis, um, statistical analysis, I found that most of the individuals, most of the APRNs who identified as being parents were knowledgeable about what a gun lock is. So a gun lock is one facet of the, uh, the multifaceted gun safety promotion uh, model. So we can see that interestingly, being a parent predisposes the individual in some way to knowing what a gun lock is and generally just having more of, an, more of a perked ear about gun safety. <coughs> From the information, we also found that most of these individuals were being thorough in their assessments and screenings. So most of them followed well child standards, which is the standard for each normal pediatric healthcare visit. They mostly screened for guns in the home, they assessed for gun safety in the home, and they taught about gun sa gun, safe gun storage. I also found that pediatric certification played a role in uh, the likelihood of APRNs to screen for guns in the home, which makes sense. I also found that the higher the level of education of these APRNs, the greater the likelihood that these individuals would teach about gun safety in the home. So there is that extra intervention piece. I also found that being a gun owner also influenced the likelihood of APRNs to either assess, screen, or intervene. So most of the, the, most of the APRNs who are gun owners were familiar with state gun laws. They screened for guns in the homes of their toddler patients. They taught about safe gun storage, and 100% of them felt that their knowledge currently was adequate to address um, the knowledge gaps in their patients and provide teachings. The APRNs also uh, worked in a variety of settings. So inpatient is what we classify as a hospital, perhaps. And outpatient is any, uh, any place where you make an appointment and go in with your child to see how they're doing. So in both of these cases, most of the APRNs did follow the standards that are in place for their practice. Again, well child standards. However, um, my research found that most of the outpatient, which is the normal well child practice setting, uh, most of these practitioners did not have work setting resources or standardized assessment tools. This indicates that this sample is willing to follow the standards and is doing a very good job of adhering to them, but we cannot follow standards that do not exist. So in summary, we can see that APRNs are screening and teaching. They are doing a great job of starting the effort to be proactive and the factors that influence the likelihood of APRNs to screen and intervene are pediatric certification, education level, and gun ownership. This all indicates that there is some sort of greater interest or knowledge that increases the comfort and therefore likelihood of an APRN to assess, screen, teach, overall intervene. 
However, we also identified gaps in, the, in my research or through my research. So we can see that no official policy or research, research development exists. So we have very general guidelines from NAPNAP and um, uh, organizations like the American Academy of Nursing that point out the goal that we can all agree on, that we should make our homes safer for toddlers and for individuals of all ages when there's a gun and gun safety, safe gun storage is imperative. However, there's no official assessment tool and there's no resource to intervene once these families are identified. So I think the next step would be to develop such tools. Another facet of uh, the recommendations that my research uh, manifested are continued advocacy and legislation. Currently, there is somewhat of a restriction on gun research um, nationally. So I think this can only hinder our progress and whatever difference we can make from the nursing profession and from all other professions. And importantly, I think as with, uh, what, as with, um, as with the nursing profession's um, basic purpose, we should remain apolitical in the approach and primarily approach this subject through the safety lens. It is also up to the healthcare professional, the APRN, the nurses, to open this dialogue because it was found that although these, pr these parents can be proactive and they may ask questions about the things that they know about and the things that they find in the literature, there's not enough in the literature, especially for the nursing profession, um, but also in general, then they can't ask questions that they don't know about. So it's up to the healthcare professional to open the dialogue and begin talking about this in a very tactful, apolitical approach. And with that, um, I'll open the floor to any questions. Thank you. Yes. Yes, I have a question. You were telling me a little bit about this before, but I'm wondering if you could elaborate for everyone um, more on sort of the contributions of your research to the nurse, the existing literature in the nation. Sure. Um, so um, currently, um, as I kind of briefly touched on, there is a wide gap in the literature about this particular sort of niche um, topic where guns and children are involved and um, particularly toddlers and those who find a gun that's improperly stored in the home. So home safety is kind of the neglected, um, understudied uh, aspect of this topic and primarily it's approached through a community lens, but we wanted to look at the home safety approach. Another thing is that um, the nursing process, as the nursing students will all know, is the acronym is ADPI, assess, diagnose, plan, implement, and evaluate. So um, having seen that there isn't enough information, I wanted to take the first step and assess. So I think that my research study um, takes the first step in assessing, and my hope is that with this research, we can move toward a more action-oriented and intervention-focused uh, approach to this topic. There was another question. Yeah, um, I was wondering if in your literature you um, came across studies, either from you know nurses or public health, that talked about what um, interventions are maybe most effective. Um, um, so that kind of falls into the realm of there being more more of a need for research. Um, but some of the interventions that were mentioned were. Um, gun locks, perhaps distributing them freely um, at, the, at the doctor's offices and healthcare facilities, which may be very, a very interesting approach. And I think that particularly if it's given um, for free, then parents are more likely to use it. And it opens up the conversation. How do I use this? What is this for? Is this really necessary? So I think that might be a great place to start. Um, but I think in general, more education and more ways of disseminating the knowledge that we have um, might be very helpful. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Agnes. <laughs> On behalf of Falvey Memorial Library and the Center for Research and Fellowships, I'd like to present you with the 2018 Falvey Scholar Award. Please join me in congratulating Agnes on her achievement. <laughs> Uh, 
And now we are moving on to our scholar number five. Uh, she will be introduced by Dr. Jerusha Corner. Thank you. Um, I actually want to begin by thanking Salvi and Jutta and Deborah and Linda and all of your colleagues for hosting this event um, and for all you do throughout the year to support and celebrate student research. This is um, really lovely and important work, so thank you. Um, Elizabeth Evie, what a gem. Uh, I've never actually had the pleasure of teaching her, uh, but uh, we've worked together for about a year and a half, I think, and our work started in earnest over Skype because she was studying abroad, and I was impressed right away by how responsible she was in these calls, um, by her intellectual initiative and curiosity, and as her research has continued to unfold, I've seen that and more. Her um, intellectual maturity, I think, has, it has been what's impressed me most about her and her professionalism. She has presented her work now. She's kind of on the circuit. She's presented her work at an international seminar at the University of Vermont. Um, she's been accepted to the Society of Research on Adolescence with a peer-reviewed poster. And uh, last week, she pre last week? Two weeks, weeks ago? ago? Yeah. Uh, she presented in New York at the American Educational Research Association Conference, again, a paper session, alongside senior scholars. And when she announced she was an undergrad, the room burst into applause. Um, I'm excited for her to share her work with you. Uh, but one thing I don't think she quite realizes is how cutting edge it is. Yesterday, I was on a call for a, a major um, RFP for a, a new grant major funding from several foundations, and the question they're asking that they want researchers to assess is the question Elizabeth takes up. So as I apply for this grant, I'm going to be citing her work, um, and it's just been a great joy and honor, a, a real privilege to work with this um, accomplished and uh, bright young woman who has a really exciting future ahead as an educator, an advocate for youth, and a scholar. Elizabeth Eden. <laughs> Dr. Connor so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, again, my name is Elizabeth, and I'm really excited to share my work with all of you today. So this work began last summer as a VERF grant, so a big thank you for, to the Center for Research and Fellowships for helping support my research over the summer. And then my work has continued this school year as part of my honors senior thesis. So the focus of my study is on the topic of student voice in high schools. And so I want to begin today by explaining to all of you a little bit more about what student voice is and why it's important. I will introduce my research question and briefly detail my methods. But then I want to spend the majority of today talking about my findings and how my findings have implications for school improvement, how we can best improve our schools. So I want to start today with a nod to all that's going on in the news. Um, so we're seeing students making headlines currently as they call for larger scale changes to the American educational system through movements like the Never Again movement, through the organization of marches and dialogues. And we're also seeing students call for smaller scale changes to their schools in particular. And so that brings me to this picture on the right. Um, this is a picture of Peter Butera, and I want to share his story with all of you today because I think it's very relevant to the work that I'm doing. So Peter graduated from high school last May. He was a valedictorian of his high school. And during graduation, during his valedictorian speech, he went off script to criticize school leaders and district administrators for not giving students enough voice and power within the school. And so in response, district administrators silenced his microphone mid-speech and escorted him off stage. And this video of Peter being walked off stage went viral. Um, Jimmy Kimmel saw the video and invited him to finish his speech on Jimmy Kimmel Live. And so I like to share this story for two reasons. First of all, I think it's very relevant to the work that I'm doing because it's an example of a student asking for more voice in his high school. But also, Peter is now a freshman at Villanova. So I don't know if any of you have met him, but he's, he's around. 
So what is student voice? So student voice is a term that emerged in the 1990s. It's grown increasingly popular ever since. And it's a term that describes the many ways in which youth might have the opportunity to participate in school decisions that will shape their lives and the lives of their peers. So student voice is what it sounds like. It's giving students a voice, giving students an active role in educational decision making and planning. There is a lot of literature out there now that details why student voice is important, that shows why student voice is beneficial for youth and why student voice programs are beneficial for schools. And what I really want to highlight is that there are a variety of studies out there that have looked at specific student voice programs and shown how those programs lead to lasting and concrete changes in school practice and policy. And so while there's a lot of literature out there about the why of student voice, there's a need for more research on how to best structure schools and create programs that honor the voices and the opinions of youth. And so my research question is an attempt to address the how. Um, so I set out to take a look at what conditions lead to the successful implementation and institutionalization of student voice programs in high schools. So this is a slide detailing my methods. So I designed my study according to exploratory case study metho methodology. I found three high schools with active student voice programs, one rural, one urban, and one suburban high school. And I wanted to take a look at a variety of different school environments to see if any conditions for success would hold across the different school contexts. At each school, I spoke with the principal, I spoke with the teacher, and I spoke with students to ask about their experience <coughs> in the student voice program their, and their involvement in the effort. All of my interviews were semi-structured and lasted between 20 and 60 minutes in length. And then after gathering all of this qualitative interview data, I analyzed the data. So in my thesis paper, I break my findings up into two sections. And so in the first section, I detail conditions that I found that were necessary to the success of the student voice programs that I looked at. And then in the second part of my paper, I introduce a framework that I call the three Ps. And, I, and I'll talk about this framework a little bit more in a moment. But first, I want to go ahead and detail the conditions. So I like to focus in my paper on two key conditions that emerged as most prominent as crucial to the implementation and the institutionalization of the student voice efforts that I studied. So the first condition for success was the support of the administration. So at each school, the teachers and the students that I talked to described their principal as a welcoming and as an encouraging figure of authority. The principals were all eager to hear what students had to say. They really wanted to take an active role in the student voice effort, and they were able to eager to connect students to resources to help translate their ideas into action and to concrete changes within the school. So I have a representative quote up here. Um, you can skim through it on your own, but this is a quote from a teacher that I spoke to from one of my schools, speaking to this idea of the support of the administration and how important that was to the work. The second condition for success that I found as most prominent, most crucial to the student voice program was the creation of a culture of care and trust and mutual respect. And so my interview participants described the environment in their student voice program as one that was welcoming, as one that was encouraging. They felt empowered to speak up and voice what they had to say. And they felt that when they did so, others were eager to listen and were receptive to their ideas. And so up here again, I have a representative quote. This is from a student from one of my schools. And so as I was thinking through and learning about these different programs, I came to realize that while all of the programs I was studying were active programs, I thought that they differed a little bit in terms of success. I didn't think they were all necessarily equally successful. Um, so that got me thinking about how to measure the success of a student bro voice program and how to talk about the success of a student voice program. And so to that end, I came up with a framework that I call the three Ps. And so this framework suggests that participation and passion and power are all elements that contribute to the success of student voice. And so I want to start by defining exactly what I mean by each of these terms. Um, so by participation, what I mean is that when you're trying to consider and evaluate the success and the effectiveness of an initiative, you need to think about how students are recruited, which students are recruited, and the number of, of, the number of opportunities that are available for students to express their voice. 
The second P is passion. And so by that, I mean you need to consider students' interest in the student voice effort and their motivation to stay involved. And then finally, power. Um, and by power, I mean you need to think about students' ability to actually affect change in the school. And so this here is how I conceptualize the relationship between the three Ps. So in these figures, the equilateral triangle represents the student voice program with one P on each vertice to symbolize how all three Ps equally um, contribute to how successful a student voice program is. And then the circle represents the school itself. And so the figure on the left represents schools that add and implement student voice initiatives or programs within the school. And then the figure on the right represents schools that from the beginning have been intentionally structured to honor student voice, not just in a specific school initiative, but in sort of every level of the classroom and the, the greater school. And so what I propose through this framework is that researchers or practitioners or policymakers can use the, this, can use the three Ps as a guide in order to evaluate the success of an existing program or as a guide as they try to design and implement a new program that best fits the needs of the school. And so what I found in my study, um, both in the specific programs that I looked at and what I found in the literature as well, was that student voice initiatives do lead to successful and lasting changes and improvements in schools. And what I conclude is that in order to effectively implement and institutionalize these programs, it's important that school leaders assume an active role it's important that all involved foster an environment that's caring and trusting and respectful. And then finally, I suggest that the particulars of a program can be either designed or evaluated according to the three Ps. And so in my study, I looked at three really different high schools with three really different programs and found that there's no one single secret to the success of student voice. But I think it's really important that schools honor students as stakeholders that schools structure themselves and create programs that lift up the voices of youth because I think students play a really important role in the school improvement process. Thank you so much for your time. I welcome any questions. Yes. Oh, sure, Agnes, go ahead. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could speak a little more into um, the way that you found your schools. Yeah, um, so... That was probably one of the most challenging aspects of the whole research project was finding schools to work with, um, especially because I was conducting this research, my field research, during the summer when, of course, schools are not in session. Um, and so my research mentor, Dr. Connor, knew some um, professors who were doing work related to this and connected me to them to ask for recommendations. Um, I did a lot of Google searches. There are also some existing student voice websites out there that publish work that schools are doing. Um, so through those different means, I found a bunch of schools that might have programs that I was looking for. So I sent a bunch of emails to a bunch of different schools and heard back from some, not all, um, and eventually was able to, to connect with principals from there. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of how many of these programs are in existence <coughs> across the country? Do they tend to appear in certain types of schools more than others? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I know that... Um, so. I think there's a need for sort of a broader database that logs sort of student voice programs happening across the country. So there's not currently one like central database that where all people with these types of programs can come together and log the work that they're doing. So I guess I don't really have a sense of how many schools have programs like this. Um, but then to your next point, I think I was able to find programs like this in a variety of different school settings, um, but I think that a lot of times student voice programs have been focused in urban schools that are in specific need of improvement and change. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you could share um, a narrative about one of your uh, favorite examples of a successful um, yeah. like incident or sure. program. Sure, sure. Um, so I think one really cool program that I looked at um, I'll call it the student voice group at one of my schools. Um, and so this was an elective course that any student could sign up for and take. And in this course, students um, surveyed the school, did some surveys, talked to students in the school, talked to teachers in the school to see what kind of improvements the school needed, and then designed school improvement projects based on that data. And then through this elective course, carried out those improvement projects with the help of the teacher and the help of the principal and the help of the school board. Um, and so the students in that program spoke so passionately and energetically about the work that they were doing and had 
created some really cool things within this school. So the students in that program are currently working on establishing a mentorship program between the high school and middle school. The students in that program spearheaded the creation of a J-term, like a two-week period in the school where students take one course that's sort of hands-on and sort of a non-traditional uh, field. Um, the students also Oh, and the students also worked to establish a high school advisory system. Um, so those are just some examples, but especially speaking to those students, it was really cool to hear all that they had done. Mm -hmm. uh, two examples at the end, you showed your uh, three teams, the three schools you went to, how did they oh, so to that? This? Uh-huh. Yes, yes, great question. So two of the schools fell under this category. So the school that I just mentioned fell under this category. Mm -hmm. The school had been established, but they decided they wanted to incorporate the feedback of students, so added this student voice group program, and then one of the schools fell under this category. Um, and I don't want to suggest that either is better than the other. I think there are successful examples of both types. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of Feldman Memorial Library and the Center for Research and Fellowship, uh, I'd like to present you with the 2018 Feldman mm -hmm. Scholar Award. Please join me in congratulating Elizabeth on her achievements. And now uh, we have uh, Professor David Radigan who will introduce the last Fowey Scholar of the day. Please welcome him. All right, so my name is David Radigan and I teach in the econ department. Uh, I've now been working with Patrick for two semesters. And as you heard Father Peter announce in the beginning, you know, this is a project that goes back to his freshman year. Um, you know, so I really jumped in late in the game. Um, and he's, he's been working with other professors as well. What I helped out with was the data analysis. Um, and I just want to give, you know, I don't want to take up too much time. I just want to give one example of, you know, how impressed with Patrick I've been and how hardworking he is. Uh, so I had him learn a new programming language to do all the data analysis. And most, most of my students you know, would sigh at that proposal, but he, uh, he took the challenge in stride and he really impressed me. Um, you will probably only see maybe one final table of results, uh, but I can tell you he's written maybe a thousand lines of code and hundreds of regressions. Um, so any results you see were painstakingly achieved. Um, and he's, he's really, really been working hard at this. Um, so here's Patrick. So thank you, Dr. Radigan. I was, uh, uh, really appreciate all those kind words, and thank you, Father Scholars. Uh, so to, to clarify, this project, uh, exact project, was not uh, all four years, but China has been all four years. So whether that's looking at U.S. going to war with China, economic disparity within China, uh, a couple other uh, things. But this, this project was definitely the deepest dive into uh, into China, and it's uh, because of this. Uh, so as an economics and political science double major, uh, a former chief economist of the World Bank once said, whether we are on the verge of an Asian century or not, one thing is clear, there's already been a dramatic shift in the geographic center of the global economy. So coming into school, uh, I, I, the first assignment I, I think was like, will the US and China go to war? And I was just like, wow, this is, this is interesting. A, I hope it never happens, but B, there's a lot of uh, material written about it. So I wanted to see, uh, uh, well, after that project, I found all these other, other sources to uh, read more about. And one thing led to another, and ultimately the study of progressive leadership uh, was what I dove into the most. Uh, and that's what you're going to learn about today. Uh, so why uh, why progressive leadership? This was the biggest uh, the biggest thing that I wanted to explore more. Uh, this was a uh, graphic in the Atlantic magazine online, and uh, it, it helped 
uh, it helped spark my interest. So on the, the darker blue is the higher uh, per capita income. Uh, this is all by province. So provinces, if you don't know, it's the equivalent of their states in China. Uh, so the darker the blue, the wealthier they were, and the darker the red, the, uh, the poorer they were. So I want to see well, what exactly is this? Well, why, why is that the case? Uh, and I, I take a look at four different schools of thought. One is liberal business laws, uh, the location of the province, uh, special economic zones, and local government officials. So liberal business laws, uh, the just uh, wind back the clock, uh, to the 1950s, really, when the People's Republic of uh, China was founded, uh, and then 1978, when uh, Deng Xiaoping took control of, uh, of China. We see, during Mao's reign, uh, communist-led uh, regime, centrally planned, uh, and uh, not, not doing well uh, economically, especially after the Greek la Great Leap Forward. Uh, it was a disaster economically. Millions of people died. Uh, so when Deng Xiaoping took control, he loosened up these. Uh, he loosened up. Let me just get rid of that. Uh, he loosened up economic restrictions and strengthened uh, business laws. So for the those who argue in favor of business laws, say that it attracted foreign investment, uh, and it was one of the earliest post Mao reforms, uh, and it does explain the availability of capital but it doesn't explain the regional gap. Uh, the laws were applied to the whole country, uh, so why not see the investment in the inner regions where re natural resources were abundant? Uh, so again, it explains capability, cap capital, but not the distribution. Uh, next is location. If you remember from the map, coast region uh, was where the wealthiest uh, provinces were located. Uh, access to the sea gave them greater uh, gave them access to the global market. Uh, China has a, developed a fantastic port system, uh, and the inland provinces just lack that. Uh, they can't market to the sea. Uh, they can't market to the whole world. But uh, China borders 14 other countries, uh, and you, you see that they have all these, uh, all these other uh, markets to uh, basically all of Eurasia. Uh, they could sell to uh, via natural resources or other products. And uh, this is anecdotal evidence, and there's weaknesses with it, but Thailand and the Philippines, uh, they, they, they have plenty of coast regions that can market to the uh, whole world, but they haven't experienced nearly the amount of growth uh, that other, or that China's uh, coastal region has. Uh, special economic zones, uh, they are actual locations where they receive special treatment from uh, compared to the rest of the country. Uh, they combine the strengths of the other schools of thought, uh, and they are directly correlated with an increase in foreign direct investment. Uh, while that's all good, the government officials, when they started this, and this was one of the earliest reforms too, uh, back in the 1980s, they knew it would cause an imbalance at first, uh, but they hoped it would have spillover effects, and we just haven't seen that. Uh, at the same time, what they could also have, uh, as the central government, they could have put these special economic zones farther inland around the border regions and take advantage of that. Uh, still, a large, uh, still a large market. Uh, again, 14 countries border China. Uh, and there's plenty of raw, raw materials in the inland provinces. So that brings me to the final school of thought that I explore uh, in more detail. Uh, leadership uh, at the provincial level. Uh, Ultimately, it's up to the local leaders to implement these reforms from the central government. Uh, and what I found in my study and uh, and the data support, it's uh, the interaction between local leaders and the central government is key. So my study uh, was also broken down into basically two, uh, two sections. One was uh, qualitative research, looking at four different provinces, and the second one was uh, uh, what Dr. Ragan helped with was uh, statistical analysis of all regions. Uh, I looked at not only provinces, but also autonomous regions and municipalities. Uh, autonomous regions, uh, so technically, uh, Tibet is not a province. Uh, it's, you'll see is they, they have more autonomy compared to uh, all, all the inland provinces, uh, basically farther, 
farther east you go, uh, the more control the central government has. Uh, but that's a side note. Uh, so Jiangxi is located uh, towards the coast. Uh, you find that the literature says that they are extremely conservative, especially when the reforms were implemented at first. Uh, they, re they refused, uh, basically, which is interesting to think about. Centrally planned economy, uh, Deng Xiaoping says, hey, we're going to have free market reforms. And these local leaders are just like, you don't know what you're talking about. Mouse, we're going to stick with Mao's uh, ideals and principles. Uh, they would have checkpoints every 30 kilometers, uh, making sure uh, farmers weren't selling uh, the illegal goods uh, and just re refused to take part in these reforms. Complete opposite story uh, in the bordering province. Uh, Fujian uh, uh, took advantage of all these reforms. They had a lot of interaction with the central government, uh, especially compared to Jiangxi, where I think the, the number is five leaders uh, actually went to work for the central government from Fujian compared to one leader from Jiangxi. Uh, Guangdong, uh, located in the Pearl River Delta, uh, really one of the economic growth uh, engines of, of China. Uh, it, I think it's around 30% uh, of their GDP is in this Pearl River Delta. Pearl Delta River uh, is generated from this one province. Uh, fantastic ports, fantastic market, uh, and progressive leaders again. They, wor they worked with the central government. Uh, there's this idea of, uh, or one of the authors calls it reciprocal accountability. Uh, so if you align your thoughts with the central government, they will invest heavily in your region. Uh, Sichuan, not as uh, successful, uh, but they did, uh, they've been experimenting with political reforms, uh, which uh, has helped the central government uh, understand what political reforms would look like in a centrally planned economy. Uh, so statistical analysis, uh, there's a lot of variables, and I won't go through all of them. If you want to ask me more about uh, about individual ones, the biggest one I want to focus on is state involvement. So state involvement is the percentage share of state-owned enterprises' uh, gross industrial output value compared to total gross industrial output value. Uh, so you see, uh, basically, state-owned enterprises owned and operated by state officials compared to total uh, gross industrial output value. I use this after looking at this. Uh, so this is a percentage share of state-owned enterprises as a share of total gross industrial output value. It's a lot to say, I know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, compared to years. Uh, so we see in 1978, steep decline in a progressive province, whereas uh, in the bordering town, uh, which had the checkpoints and was not progressive, you see almost no decline until way, uh, way later, uh, back in early 2000s, really. Uh, so I use this as a proxy for progressive leadership. Uh, again, uh, when you look at all 31 regions uh, that I looked at, similar patterns. So progressive leaders, sharp decline when the reforms are introduced. Uh, not so progressive uh, provinces. Uh, it was almost like we don't we don't believe in this right now, so we're just going to keep on doing what we have been doing. So the results from this uh, that uh, the coefficient uh, was highly statistically significant, with point uh, a negative point zero nine one. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, well, if you had zero percent uh, state involvement and you cranked it up to a hundred percent state involvement, you'd see a decrease in GDP per capita of 9.1%. Uh, so that's not relevant. Uh, it's, it, that's more theory uh, based, that's uh, coefficient. When you look at uh, when you look at the 15 year difference from when the reforms started to uh, just 15 years later, uh, these numbers, uh, I, I use that just to show uh, 15 years should give leaders enough time to adjust and implement the reforms suggested by the central government. So in Fujian, uh, Fujian it, uh, state involvement decreased by 44%, and GDP per capita, uh, and it was associated with a uh, GDP per capita increase of 4%. Uh, Sichuan uh, decreased in 42% state involvement, uh, associated with an increase in GDP per capita of 3.82%. Uh, and then the other two, uh, other Guangdong uh, associated with 3.91%. 
If you look at just uh, Jiangxi, which was the conservative province, they actually increased state involvement uh, by 2%. So according to the model, uh, GDP per capita decreased by 0.18%, holding all else constant. Uh, Setters Paribas is a very, uh, uh, economists like to use that term uh, a lot. So what now? Uh, I'm realizing I went through a lot uh, in a small period of time. Uh, so I want to just slow down for a second and say, uh, so, so that's all, in all, all good. Uh, we understand that uh, it just kind of stinks to be an inland province. You, you don't have access to the market. You don't have, uh, you're not seeing progressive leaders, especially during the 1980s. Uh, that, that's changing, and it should become even more extreme of uh, a change uh, in the coming uh, five to 10 years. So just recently, actually after I, uh, within the past, I think, three weeks, uh, President Xi uh, was able to, uh, did two, two big things. One was he got rid of uh, term limits. So he's now the most powerful leader in China since Mao. Uh, and he also, at the, their, their equivalent of like a, not a G20, but an economic forum, the Boao Forum, uh, President Xi said that China is now the world's vanguard of free trade. Uh, kind of taking a jab at all these other Western countries that are calling for uh, more isolationist policies. Uh, and one of Xi's biggest, uh, his biggest initiatives moving forward, I, I think he wants to be defined by this 100 years from now. When you read about President Xi, I think that he wants to be associated with the One Belt, One Road. Uh, one Belt, One Road initiative uh, should help uh, inner provinces. Uh, why? Because it's basically the 21st century Silk Road. So all of Eurasia in this in this project is going to be connected with gas lines, electricity, rail, uh, and then even so that that's all over land in Eurasia. And there's going to be a the road portion. I was confusing if you think about it, the road portion is actually the sea route, and it goes all the way through past the tip of Africa into a, uh, into Europe. So hopefully that helps the, inter, uh, the provinces in inland develop uh, more. It, it'll be interesting to see how Xi deals with progressive leaders. He's really, uh, he's really purging uh, people who don't agree with him right now, consolidating power. Uh, but once he's done with this political purge, he should be able to pick progressive leaders to run these provinces inland. Uh, but he also has to convince the national, uh, the all other countries in Asia, uh, to do the same. So it'll be interesting to see how that uh, progresses. But I think they understand the free market has helped them greatly, uh, and I, I have high hopes. I think it will be uh, it will be beneficial for everyone in China. Uh, the IMF has not supported it. It will take a lot. Uh, China will take on a lot of debt, but uh, it, it, it's something exciting. And, and within our lifetime, it could be one of the greatest economic achievements uh, in mankind's history, uh, if everything goes according to plan. So any questions? Did you study abroad in China? I have not. I, t I told Father Peter, I said, I've been doing this for so long. And he said, well, when did you study abroad? And I was like, I haven't. <laughs> but I would like to go someday and uh, especially visit the coast. Which, uh, all the pictures are beautiful. So what are your plans? by by working with the project for so long, I know everything that's wrong with it. <laughs> so, and there's a lot. Uh, the especially the state involvement uh, is that the best proxy for progressive leadership? I I don't know. It, it's because different provinces might have required more state involvement for a longer period of time for a whole bunch of other reasons. Uh, so wh whether or not I can find a better source of data, uh, for anyone who studied China, uh, finding data is reliable data is incredibly challenging. Uh, actually, the Falvey uh, Library does have a subscription to allchinadata.com or ch .org, which is mind-boggling when I first saw it, uh, to have provincial-level statistics 
that spanned 50 years uh, is just before before last semester it was just unheard of I, I was actually my jaw dropped when I first saw it uh, which is the nerd in me but uh, for where to take it from here I, I think if I can find uh, qualitative data uh, instead of just focusing on those four uh, if I can find qualitative data on everyone and trace back the history of provincial leaders I think that could give a stronger case uh, to show not only do I have quantitative data but also these leaders uh, whether they were born like some of the leaders were born in certain provinces that later got more attention from the central government uh, but ev even that data is tough to keep track of when you go back to 1978 and 1980s they uh, it's interesting when you're looking at data a lot of it starts in 1978 uh, so you can't get that uh, there's a term in uh, economics for the difference in difference where you can track uh, and see when a policy was initiated, how it would have differed had no, no policy been initiated. And for China, you can't do a lot, at least when the reform started, because they just started taking, they just realized how important data was. Uh, but no, I, I, I'll, I'll be on the hunt for ma more data in the future. Any more questions? Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. On behalf of the Harvey Library and the Center for Research and Fellowships, I would like to present you with the 2018 Harvey Scholar Award. Thank Please you. join me in congratulating Patrick on his achievement. And in conclusion, I would like to thank all six Harvey Scholars and their faculty members for attending today's event. The library is very proud to uh, support exceptional undergraduate research here at Villanova. And thank you for attending today's event. Uh, have more refreshments before you go? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.